Alright, you guys, welcome to episode number 16 of the Not Quite Famous podcast. I am your host, Greg Asdorian, comedian, writer, filmmaker, lover. Uh, you guys, we have an amazing episode today. Our guest is Kevin Avery, incredibly talented comedian, Emmy nominated writer. Uh, you guys, uh, we have an amazing discussion. It's going to be a lot of fun. You guys are going to enjoy it. Um, I'm in one of those weird, reflective moods this week. Let's start off that way. Um, I've been thinking about a lot of stuff. Um, things that affect me directly, things that are superficial, things that... Honestly... Kind of terrify me and make me worry about the world... <laughs> I know that's kind of general and kind of vague, but what I'm, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a cliche hacky thing for a parent to say. I feel, even as a parent, I sound like a hack. Um, as you all know um, about what happened in Orlando, um, there are no words for that. Uh, what happened in Orlando was a tragedy. Um, to say the least. Um, I'm not someone who is overly political, especially in my comedy or my art or anything like that. Uh, I'm not someone who's going to try and politicize this. Um, life is precious. That's really what it comes down to. Um, lives were taken before they should have been Life is something fleeting, and this is what this reminds us all of. I personally have spent this week thinking so much about malice and the nature of evil in the world and the nature of ignorance. And I, I find myself wondering, how do I protect my son from that ignorance in this world? I mean, that ignorance comes in a lot of forms. You know, obviously, I'm not saying this guy was just ignorant. That's the only reason. This guy was clearly mentally ill. Um, sounds like he had some, maybe some self-hating issues going on. I don't know all the details as far as the shooter goes. Because, um, honestly, part of me is afraid to, to delve into the an attempt at understanding a mind like that. That's not really... I don't need to find out why he was broken. Um, he was broken and he hurt people. That's what matters at this moment. Um, <laughs> I find myself uh, struggling to care about useless bullshit. <laughs> I find myself struggling to care about things that are everyday. You know, like what stupid thing Kanye West did this week. What, you know, whether or not I'm going to enjoy the extended cut of Batman v Superman better than I did the theatrical version, uh, which I did, by the way. Um, I... I don't have a direct link to what happened in Orlando the way a lot of people I know do. Uh, I'm not part of that community, for lack of a better term, beyond the fact that I have people like that in my life that I care about, and I saw how they were hurt and affected by this. And I see a look of pain and sadness and anger on their faces that they don't deserve. And I see the same thing on the victims of the on the families of the victims. This wasn't about this wasn't about something superficial. 
This was about something real and tangible. And this was about a type of hate and persecution. I'm sorry, persecution that I'm never going to understand. But life is precious. And I do feel hurt. As a member of the world, as a citizen of the world, as a member of the human race, as a sentient person, when life gets stamped out for no reason besides ignorance and hate and malice, I feel that too. I know I completely understand I will never feel it in the same way as some of my friends and loved ones in the, in the gay community will. But life is precious. I don't, uh, I don't politicize things. I already said that at the beginning of this. Um, the kind of ignorance and bigotry that happened in Orlando terrifies me because I am partly because I am a Hispanic and Middle Eastern child of two immigrants. My son even though he's half white is still also of Hispanic and Middle Eastern descent. Bigotry is terrifying if you've experienced it. That's why, it, yeah, Donald Trump is a punchline to a lot of us. But to those of us who actually could be affected by the things he threatens, it's terrifying. The thought of being persecuted, me and my son, me and my brother, me and my family, because of ignorance is terrifying and it's tangible and yeah a lot of things that, that people like Trump, Trump say are going to happen logically won't I, I believe that America won't let that happen I have to believe that it's the only way I feel good bringing my son up in this world that we're in right now I have to believe that. But what happened in Orlando was a reminder that regardless of whether you're gay, straight, brown, white, black. All right, boss, I got that one open. Uh, oh, you know. That's all right. Bigotry is real. And it's dangerous. And it's all around us. And we shouldn't pretend it's not there. You guys, normally I'll say like at the end of the podcast, like, hey, go to my website, go to iTunes. You know, if you want to buy any of my albums, anything like that. If any of you haven't bought my albums and wanted to, don't. Um, <laughs> I would love for you guys to do that later on. But right now, if you have some money to burn... There are so many amazing LGBT groups in the Orlando, Florida area that are doing amazing work to help victim relief. Please, please, please go out and check out all the LGBT groups in Orlando. Uh, they're doing amazing work. Send your money there right now. Help them. Help the people. Because right now, thoughts are great, and thoughts are amazing sentiment. Sending good thoughts into the universe is one thing, but it's not as tangible as what that <laughs> shooter did. So, thoughts and prayers, awesome. But do something as tangible, too. All right, that was my emotional diatribe. Uh, <laughs> getting into this episode, um, Kevin Avery, um, he is one of the funniest comics, I think, that's come out of the Bay Area in the last 20 years. He is brilliantly funny. Um, 
incredibly, incredibly funny. Uh, he's uh, been Emmy nominated for his work. He uh, wrote for Totally Biased with Kamau Bell, another awesome comic from the Bay Area. Uh, that show was on FX. Got canceled way too soon. Amazingly funny show. Um, also, Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. He writes on that currently. Um, yeah. Uh, was on Best Week Ever, VH1. Is hands down one of the funniest guys I know. He has an award winning short film that he wrote and starred in called Thugs the Musical, which is so goddamn fun. Me and Kevin end up having this really fascinating conversation about uh, the industry and uh, about how race plays into a factor with uh, an audience's expectations. It's really fascinating. Um, I really enjoyed this interview. Uh, this is another one that was done a little while back and is just getting released um, because life. <laughs> uh, but Kevin Avery is one of the smarter comics I think you're ever going to hear. Uh, whether it's through his writing for the TV shows or on stage, I think he's incredibly poignant, incredibly clever, and I'm really glad that we got to sit down and talk to each other. Uh, it's funny, for both being San Francisco comics, uh, this interview was, um, was, the fir was the longest we'd ever talked to each other. Uh, we kind of were in different circles, I suppose, uh, when he was still in SF. So it was really nice to actually kind of get to know him and see beyond the like you know local myth man and legend and all that. And I had a great time talking to Kevin. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I do. Uh, some other info for you guys. I have a bunch of shows coming up. So if you guys want to go to my calendar, gregasdoreen.com, click on upcoming shows. All the info is there. Coming up really soon. Um, every Wednesday night, Wednesday night comedy at Massey's in Walnut Creek, California. I'm there every week. This week uh, is Sammy Obeyed, so I'm very excited about that. We're also going to sit down and record an episode of this for you guys. Um, I've been wanting to talk to him for a while, and we're finally going to get to sit down and do it. Then uh, July 16th. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Before that, I'm skipping one. July 8th. I'm going to be headlining a show in Fresno, California. Fresno, July 8th. Armenians, I'm talking to you. You guys, please come out. Check out that show. It's always a lot of fun. I love doing Fresno. You guys are awesome. Then July 16th, I will be in Napa again at the Lucky Penny Cultural Arts Center with two of my favorite people. I'll be performing with the one and only Larry Bubbles Brown, Mr. Fun. <laughs> and co Bay Area comedy legend Johnny Steele uh, another Pittsburgh high school graduate me and I'm always commiserate about that awesome awesome show tickets are online the link is on my website so go upcoming shows gregasdoring.com uh, then I have got July 21st I'll be in Modesto so again another show in the valley you guys come out that if Fresno is too far from you and you're in the Modesto area well July 21st, Modesto. I will be there. Uh, then mostly just stuff in San Francisco for a while. I'll be working on my film that I told you guys about last week, Twelfth Night. That is going to be in production for most of the summer, so not a ton of road dates. Uh, two more dates in Napa, though. Uh, August 26th, uh, I'll be at the Lucky Penny Cultural Arts Center in Napa with Sammy Obeyed and uh, Phil Johnson. So that'll be fun. Phil Johnson, awesome comic, uh, who I spend a lot of time on the road with. Sammy Obeyed from Conan, America's Got Talent, you name it. He's uh, a dear friend of mine and one of the funniest cats working right now. Then, August 27th, you can see me with Laurie Kilmartin. Oh yeah, that's happening. And Ash Fisher is the feature act. Uh, it's going to be the three of us together. It's going to be an awesome show. I haven't seen Lori in forever. Um, she is uh, just kicking ass right now. All the stuff on Conan is great. Uh, she's a monologue writer for Conan. Uh, she's also a New York Times best-selling author, Shitty Mom. Hilarious, hilarious book. Um, if you're a parent, fucking get that book because it's amazing. <laughs> Helped me see a lot of the humor and the craziness of being a dad when I first started uh, being a parent. But yeah, no, um, Lori is hilarious and awesome. Uh, you guys have heard her on the show before. We had her on. She's amazing. Uh, she'll be in Napa with me and Ash Fisher. 
August 27th. Uh, and I've got a ton of shows beyond that uh, in the fall. So please just go to gregazorian.com, look at the upcoming show calendar, give us some love. Uh, and here now is my interview with Kevin Avery. Hi, Kevin. Hey. I'm we're good. S- yeah, we're sitting here with Kevin Avery. Um, Therapy style. I know, right? We got you laying down in the bed. <laughs> Literally, I'm laid out on the bed. I've never been on this side of this situation before. It's interesting. Yeah. I've well. never been the one not laying down in therapy session. Well, you know. <laughs> Gotta try new things. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, because like, uh, me and you, we both were part of the SF comedy scene at the same time, but we didn't really work together. No, I mean, I, we, I don't know when you started. I started in 05. Okay. So that was a few years before I left. Okay. I yeah, left so we overlapped a little bit. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, we overlapped a little bit, but we never really, like, worked together until... That's why, like, I remember when I'm e- emailing you for this, I'm like, I don't know if you remember who I am. No, I remember who you were, <laughs> but I mean, I we just never... I, you know, I mean, 05, what the hell? I didn't even know what I was doing in 05, but... Probably the same bullshit, just hanging out. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. It, that was that was. I was itching to leave San Francisco yeah. at that point, and so I was kind of. I probably stopped doing as many shows or, ju- or as many sets just around town. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'd been here a long time. I started, oh, Jesus, in 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 '96. Uh, Okay. No, 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 no. That's not true. But ninety-seven. Okay. Well, almost ninety, like early ninety-seven. Yeah, I was like, I was, I was seventeen when I started. So, two thousand four then. So two thousand four, I started. Yeah, I was still in high school. Like the first time I did like an open mic and stuff like that. When in two thousand four? Oh, like early two thousand four, like January, or February. Okay. Two thousand four. I remember my first set was right after my birthday, and it was god awful. Like I remember, it's still good. one of my favorite bombs of like my career. You know, I feel <laughs> like when you bomb early, when you start eating it early, it helps you to um, if you stick with it. If you don't, because it, it's very discouraging. Yeah, but because you don't know not to take it personally, or you don't know that it's not the end of the world. You just it just feels shitty. Yeah. And but I do feel like that instills this work ethic in you that keeps you it's it's okay to it makes you feel like well it's okay to fail yeah. on stage it's okay to you know what I'm saying and so you're all you're always trying to move up because and this is going to sound like a like a, here's the thing when I started I was a good performer I was not yet a good comic okay and so I could, I could get la- I mean, San Francisco is a place that teaches you how to kill. Yeah. And if you're not careful, it doesn't teach you how to just craft a tight set or a good strong, you know. And yeah. so, um, I I would I was doing well, but you just get addicted to that. Yeah. And then you stop. Uh, it's harder to work to to put. To try new things and shit. Well, we all know tons know. of guys that can kill in San Francisco, but their material doesn't work anywhere else either. Well, that's a whole other thing yeah. too, where it's like, yeah, that's a that's a. T- you have to be careful of it. I mean, there are all sorts of ways to sort of box yourself in. I mean, like, I remember people used to talk about, you know, being careful to not write for the road. Yeah. And, and, you know, at first, the road just means doing one-nighter gigs. So you're out yeah. in the middle of nowhere, and you're playing Battle Mountain, Nevada, or <laughs> Winnemucca, Nevada, or, or uh, uh, Ely, Nevada. They're all in Nevada. Yeah. Um, or wherever, Montana, you know. And so it's, it can be very easy to write for those little barroom shows. Yeah. And then you're not really developing. You're just sort of figuring out what, what is just going to make these people... What's going to get me out of here alive and yeah. feeling okay about myself when I'm, you know... Staying in the Ramada Inn yeah. later that night. I've got a great Winnemucca story actually. The first really? time I ever worked out there, like, cause I'm I'm usually in a suit and tie when I'm on stage, especially mm-hmm. when I'm on the road. And there's this like karaoke bar like down the street from the casino, and I just go there just for something to do. And I walk in, and I'm the only person in this room not wearing a cowboy hat. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna die. Yeah, this is this is how it's gonna end. 
I'm going to get dragged behind a truck to my death playing Toby Keith. Sure. <laughs> were you? But but they were probably nice. They were. They were remarkably yeah. nice. Like it, it caught me off guard. Like I, I I've done that Winnemucca show a lot in the mm-hmm. last few years, and I always it, enjoy it, the Winners Inn. Yeah. The oh winners, man, I the miss winners the Winners Hotel and Casino. Oh boy, <laughs> most ironically named place on earth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had some great times at the Winners <laughs> Hotel and Casino, and um, and met some great people. Saw yeah. some weird shit, but you know, um, it's two nights of just. Well, I guess I better figure out how to do this. Yeah. And you, because you always do those gigs too before you're yeah. actually, quote unquote, ready. Well, it's it's way better when you're the headliner too, because then you get to see what doesn't work for the future. Yeah. That's yeah, that's nice. true. That's true. You kind of get to coast, but either way, it's it's you know you're getting something out of that. You know. Yeah. I I still like all the like all the random triple shows and stuff like that. It's yeah. Like, it's scar tissue, but it's fun. It's nostalgic sometimes. I at one point, I I had this idea that I wanted to do, <laughs> that I wanted to put together a tour that was specifically all those, <laughs> all those cities that I had done, all those places. I don't think it's a good idea, and it probably never <laughs> happen. But I thought it would be kind of fun to like, just a tour of those various whatever what you know like. Uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and, <laughs> and uh, Billings, Montana, and just all those little towns out there, you know. But you, you're describing my calendar right now. That's the best part about this. It's like that's still, <laughs> that's still my calendar right now. <laughs> what fun! Those guys, but you know, I used to love that shit. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and if you could do it with a buddy, that's even better. Yeah. Like I used to do some with Kamau. Um, you know, uh, W. Kamau Bell. Yeah. Uh, he and I would, you know, he started, he, we started here at about the same time. He actually started in Chicago before me. And then he came out here and sort of restarted. But I would do that with him. There was this, um, now I'm blanking on this guy's name, so never mind. But, uh, yeah, you know, a couple people, like, would, you know, uh, would grab me and say, hey, you want to do this? Or, or I'm doing this run. This guy, Jason Zahn, that's who I'm, sorry, Jason, uh, who I doesn't even do comedy anymore, but we were like comedy best pals for a while, yeah. and he took me on my first run, and it was great, It was and it was just a bunch of, you know, cities up through northern, like way, way, way north of California, Redding, and uh, I can't remember now, but, you yeah, know, yeah. That, those were fun times to just, you know, hang out, have go, adventures. <laughs> That's the thing is that it's important to travel with somebody who you don't want to murder for after spending more than yeah, five years dude. Because I've had the opposite. Where I mean, I haven't had anybody who's really awful, but I did travel with this one dude who was pro- well. He probably hated me because I had a cold, and by the end of the week, I'd gotten him sick. But I, he drove me nuts because he was, and this sounds like a cliche to say, but he was always on. Uh, okay. He yeah. was just always. Trying to, you know, I, I guess sometimes that's how comedians cope or handle. That's how we do it. That's how we handle the situation by kind of being the comic. Yeah, but sometimes a genuine moment is nice. <laughs> like that's. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I mean, maybe people like because I just remember one particular night where we were we'd finished this show and there were these girls hanging out. It was like four or five. It was a bachelor party, I don't know. Yeah. And they were just sitting at the table with us. We were all having a conversation, but he just seemed to be doing bits. Not even from his act, but just kind of... You know you, how you could hear it in someone's yeah. voice? And just that tone, that... Uh, uh, and he was... He, uh... Not to say that that's what, that's what we sound like when we're doing our stuff. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, he... I don't know, he just turned it on... And it was just really hard to watch and kind of... We we I, we were tired of each other after... I remember when he dropped me off at the airport. And there was... it was. I mean, you talk about unceremonious. Just like, well, later, buddy! And he just peeled up away. As we ran out the door. He was like, later! I remember one of my... Uh, who's someone who's, and who's a good friend of mine. Uh, he doesn't do stand-up anymore. Uh, but... Uh, he... He had the iPod of, like, a 12-year-old girl, and I was just like, really? This is oh, what we're wow. going to listen to, like, the whole way? Well... Like, we were driving, like, to L.A. or something, and just, like, it was just awful. Was it me? Because <laughs> I've uh, been known to 
it was all like air supply and like you know what? it was like hey, pop music y stuff and like is what is wrong with air supply? Air supply is good. I don't listen to air doses, supply, but like he had like the their discography stuff. and like it was just like it was it was very much not and like I, I listen to a lot of eclectic music. Like, you know, I love I love hip hop, I love uh, classic rock stuff, I like you know, newer alternative stuff. I like my, my tastes are all over the place. I've been playing music my whole life, so I kind okay. of love everything that catches my ear, but just like I don't know, it just something about it, it was just all pop garbage for the most part. Like eighty percent of it was just pop garbage. Okay, like, but I have to go back to air supply. <laughs> because I don't I I don't I've probably heard Air Supply's music. Mm. You know, you hear all these bands and shit over time, but like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know their music. And so, is Air, I would never think the Air Supply is, some, is like, you would refer to that as a 12 year old girl's. I, I feel like they're, well, like, for the time period when it was, it was like, it was like top 40 kind of stuff. Oh, really? Like, it was, I think it was like when they popped, kind of, or like one of their albums was really popular and just. I know. I don't know. I, I guess I'm kind of a snob about music. I'm I, not real, saying, I just realized no, that right now. But no, no, no. I'm not. Gonna, <laughs> I'm just like I am very uneducated on classic rock. Okay. So to speak, because I didn't grow up listening to that for the most part. Every once in a while, I dip back and forth, and you know. But like I, so a lot of that, I'm like, well, so what is that? Should I know? It's like I always try to do this bit about how white people and black people have to figure out our music have to fi- because what white people think is cool black people are like no 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 that's not cool yeah. and what black people think is cool white people are like no like for instance every time I go to a wedding uh, I hear uh, like a, a wedding and it's white people invariably uh, someone plays um, what, some, something by like Tone Loke or Young MC. <laughs> like, you gotta hear Wild Thing or Bust a Move. And that is not... And white people love... They fucking run to the dance floor. They're so excited. And black people are like, this is not... No, this is not rap. But meanwhile, but I remember when I was in college, my friends and I... I went to a black college, and mm-hmm. some of my friends and I, we loved Sting. <laughs> we love Sting. We thought, man, Sting is so. I remember this one. I remember one day this guy sitting around. He was just like, everything Sting does is fat. Sting, he's just <laughs> fat, man. He's just, Sting is so fat. <laughs> I was, and I'm like, I like Sting too, but holy shit, this yeah. guy loves it. Fields of Gold is fat. I love, you know, I just he was so into it. And then I talked to my white friends, and they're like, Sting, what the? Yeah. F- no, God, no, what are you? <laughs> So I don't, you know, we gotta figure it out. Yeah, it's my one of my. Uh, this sounds so cliche to say. It, one of my best friends is black. No, but uh, one of my closest friends is black, and we we hang out in Walnut Creek all the time because they live mm-hmm. out there, and he lives in Benicia, which is pretty white too. And we'll be like at a bar or something like that, and like you know, the somebody will do like Young MC or like Digital Underground yeah. on karaoke or something, like that, and everyone looks at him for like permission. It's like it's hilarious to do what? To, like I don't know. To get like, up and is dance? it? Is it? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Like is it okay that a white person is singing this right now? He just like sure. his, everyone looks at him. It's kind of hilarious. You're the only people who are going to sing that. Yeah, that's no black. Black people <laughs> probably don't even know the words to bust a move. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a soft spot for uh, Run DMC though. I love me. But some that's DMC. that is. Real hip hop. I mean, yeah. look, I don't want to say Young MC or Tone Loke are real hip hop, <laughs> but you know, they're all, they're all. Do- everyone does it has their own thing. But like Run DMC, that is, that is real. Hip- that is deep hip hop. That yeah. those are dudes who are, you know, they're not. I wouldn't say they're the fathers of hip hop, <laughs> obviously, but they're definitely they're on the ground floor yeah. of you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. why not? I mean, I love to watch white people sing. Um, What's that song by uh, 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 Four Non Blondes? Uh, What's going on? Okay, yeah. Oh my God! It look if you were in a bar <laughs> and that song starts playing, <laughs> uh, without fail, before the end of the song, every white person in that bar will be singing along, like a a, a group. Maybe not everybody, but before the end of the song, everybody. <laughs> you know, most everybody, the whole room will be singing that chorus. Yeah. And I bet friends on this. I've seen this happen all the time. <laughs> and they're like, it's not happening, Kevin. And I just wait, just hold on. And sometimes it's taken all the way to the very last chorus. And then and people can't, they just can't hold it. They're like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just can't 
contain it. And I don't blame him. It's a fun song to sing. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating. I go to a bar and put that in the jukebox. <laughs> Maybe not earlier in the night, but by, the, by you know, 10, 11, you put that on. I might do that in Walnut Creek tonight on my way home. Yeah. Oh, Walnut Creek, are you kidding me? Yeah. Then we'll be able to contain themselves. <laughs> It'll be great. Wait, so, all right, so what music did you, like, grow up with? Like, what, what was your, like, wheelhouse? Well, I did this weird thing where I listened to, I grew up listening to a lot of, I guess, R&B, soul music. Soul music. No one calls it that anymore. But yeah. That, that's what it was being called at that time. And, um, but then I would switch because I went to this all white Catholic school. Okay. It was me and like a handful of other black people and my brother. And so I guess in a weird way, I did, uh, like, I have always said, well, I didn't really have an identity crisis or, had, you know, but in a weird way, I kind of did because I was constantly going back and forth. And maybe I was just experimenting. I don't know. But like, I would listen to, I don't know, like, I mean, it, whatever was whatever was hot on, on the radio at the time. Sometimes it was like that, like sort of later Stevie Wonder stuff, okay. uh, Michael Jackson, uh, you know, whatever, um, just R and B kind of stuff. But then. Every once in a while, I would switch over. Okay. And completely go, like, like what are they listening to on the modern or alternative rock station? Okay. And I would just listen to that. and that. So I would go through these mini phases. <laughs> and, um, but basically, at some point, I became all about New Edition. Okay. That was, New Edition was my <laughs> shit. Uh, I listened to a lot of... Like old school, rap, which wasn't old school at the time, but yeah. like Run DMC, Houdini, UTFO, LL, you know, all those guys. Um, yeah, by the time like hip hop was breaking wide, I was, okay. oh man, I was deep in it. <laughs> yeah, I was a, I was a suburban b boy, yeah. which is it's hard to be. But so where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in San Jose, California. Okay. Yeah. So, like, in the Bay Area, but not, like, in San Francisco proper and like that? No, 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 yeah. no. No, I didn't move to San Francisco till I started doing comedy. Okay. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. My dad moved to the U.S. Mm -hmm. when he was 12. Okay. So he just embraced American everything. Where were you from? Food. My father grew up in Beirut. Okay. Yeah, I'm a weird combination. My mother's okay. from El Salvador. My father grew up in Beirut. Wow. Yeah, my parents met at City College of San Francisco in the 80s. Nice. Yeah, weird combination. That yeah. seems like a... That just seems... That for some reason, El Salvador yeah. and Beirut, yeah. and you meet at City College. Yeah. <laughs> that just fits perfectly. I can, <laughs> I, in my head, I see the, the photograph. Yeah. Of like in the documentary, it also means I'm not ethnic enough on either side to get booked for those kind of shows. I'm not Middle no. Eastern enough to get those. I'm not Latino enough to get booked. For I those mean, shows. unless you start doing, unless you start leaning hard in either direction. But eh, I'd rather just write jokes. <laughs> yeah, you, can, you know, I mean, it's funny. I I have a hard time with. I don't know. At some point, I I got in my own head and I sort of hobbled myself. I think, but. Like, I would do shows in Oakland and didn't really think about it. I used to do this place called um, Something on Broadway. And it's closed down now. But this dude, Yaya, he used to book it, this African guy. And he, and he liked me and they would put me on the show and I would just do it. And it was a, it was a black audience, you know. Okay. It was a small crowd. It was like this big restaurant and then they would get, you know, some people in there. It was, or it was really a, like a club. Okay. Because we'd perform on the dance floor. And I thought nothing of going in there and performing. And I was newish. So, you know, inside of three years or something, doing comedy, probably less. But one day, I went in and it was packed. Okay. And it was an all black crowd. And I, uh, I was doing, I tried some new stuff. Okay. And it did not go over well. I was st I, w I think I'd done it one other time but you know when you do a bit and sometimes it works and the next time you do it and you stumble over it you're trying to remember it too yeah. much you know what did I do before and it just I kind of stumbled through this bit and man 
It did not work, and I just kind of ate it. And that freaked me out with black audiences from then on. Now, I don't know if if that hadn't happened, if I would be able to walk into any room in, like, Oakland or any black mm -hmm. crowd and, you know, do my thing, and they, they would be, yeah, well, we'd love to hear you talk about the Apple Store. But I, I feel like that's not the case. I, I used to be afraid of black audiences, and then I did a show at this place on MacArthur, mm -hmm. like, deep you MacArthur. You should be. And like yeah, I, and I and I I was because I, I just I thought like, you know I my, I felt like my skill set wasn't ready for it like because like this place is a rowdy venue and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, and then I do the, sh the set and like a minute in I get there and I like I do have, do really well, and then uh, Kevin Monroe who's one of my best friends, and is a hilarious comedian. I hate it, that guy. Really? Yeah. No, huh. I'm kidding. <laughs> you never hear that. No one's ever like fuck Kevin. I know. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, Kevin's great. Yeah, he's one of my best friends, and like he he eats it like hard. Uh huh. And this like he gets off stage, and about uh, this like group of like really there was really boisterous uh, black women come over to us, and they keep talking about how. Uh, they they were talking about how my set like they were quoting jokes to me like it was great just one mm -hmm. of those great moments and they just turned to Kevin like boy you even close to black enough to be in here ah, I did well but Kevin Monroe wasn't yeah. black enough that was that was a great moment but see do you get why that happens I mean it's because it's a weird thing where like I guess there's a sweet spot where if you are you know so Kevin Monroe is yeah I don't know like Kevin suffers from the same thing I. I think I did, where, yeah, it's the not black enough thing. Yeah. And, uh, it's, what, I, I used to have this, this, another, like, close comedy buddy that I would run around with all the time, um, this dude, Brian Kellen. And Brian and I were very, we were, like, we didn't have the same act, but, he was like the white version of me, and I was like the black version of him. Okay. We were both very physical and kind of goofy, and you know, and um, and so he would. So we played this. We did this room called the End Zone in Oakland, mm -hmm. and I I've done it maybe two, maybe three times. And he, I went up and ate it. Okay. And but I ate it in that friend. You know how sometimes you can eat it and the crowd's kind of with you, but they're just like, it ain't working, buddy. Yeah. You know, but they're still like, they're not trying to be dicks. But you know, I went down in flames. Brian gets up there. Just he's sort of a, a goofy looking white guy, kind of dork, you know, and just kills, destroys. And I'm like, how the fuck, you know? But it's because, and this is the thing with you, you know. A black audience, is, a black audience sees you walk up on that stage, and they're like, "Okay, this is, he's going to be different than what we're used to. We're going to open our minds a little bit yeah. more because it's not what we're you know." But if I walk up there, or you know, Kevin Monroe walks up there, they might be thinking, "Okay, now we like." Sometimes I think black audiences, not black people. At comedy shows, but black audiences as a whole, as a, mm -hmm. you know, I think, you know, we tend to put it in our mind as to what we think comedy is going to be when we see a black performer. Um, um, that's gross. Um, and uh, so, I, I don't know, you can maybe figure a way around that, or maybe uh, you just go, eh, fuck it, it's not going to be my room. It's not, I'm not going to, you know. Yeah, it's like, I know, like, I'm not... Even if I know it might be work for the first few minutes, I'm mm -hmm. just not afraid of any audience anymore. Yeah, point. good. Just, yeah, yeah. I've been doing it's you know over ten years now. I just like, I, I'm not afraid of any crowd. Yeah. Like I remember once I was at the I think it was the Improv in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. I was there. We did like three shows there. I was the feature act, mm -hmm. and uh, like two out of three shows, great. Yeah. One show, just this redneck crowd, just Hispanic, Middle Eastern, San Francisco, they wanted nothing to do with me. Yeah. And just like, I ate it for like 35 minutes, just silence. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh, I'm not afraid of anything. This is like 300 yeah. people just like ignored me for the last 35, 40 minutes. Yeah, no, no crowd is gonna scare me anymore, and no rejection from a woman for that matter. <laughs> but nothing, uh, no, no social interaction is ever gonna scare me ever again after that. Uh, I mean, after a while, <laughs> it's, it, something will. Yeah. But that's how you know you're alive. 
<laughs> That's how you know you're still living and breathing. You know, I was so frustrated with the because you know I would get these roles and uh, these auditions and like, especially voiceover stuff. My I, I had this agent out here in San Francisco who would send me these things to read for. Now, that's it's voiceover, so it's all voice. So there's no opportunity to be physical to show, yeah. well, he looks like this, he could put, you know. So it's all, and I was getting these, you know, things where, you know, the calls for, well, we, we want an African-American male who, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not, listen to me. I'm not yeah. the guy they're specifically, then they need a specific voice, yeah. and it's not going to be mine. And people go, well, what does black sound like? Ah, yeah. And I mean, you know what? It, you know what it sounds like. <laughs> Don't act like, what does that mean even? Yeah, shut the fuck up. It's, it's definitely, when someone's looking for a black voice or a black character or some idea they have, you know, they're looking for something specific. And uh, so these voiceover things, I, I got to the point where I was like, they would hand me a couple, and I go, I'm not going to do that one. I will do this one. And the only time I booked voiceover gigs is when it was for, when they were parts that weren't for, specifically for black actors. Okay. It's like, uh, see, I went to high school in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. California. Yeah. So, like, which is, you know, it's like Oakland without getting to see the ocean every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, the most off-putting thing in the world to me was, like, these, like, ghetto white kids who, like, tried to play it up and, like, tried yeah, to, yeah. like, play that role or whatever. And it was so off-putting to me that, like, I'm just like, yo, I'm going to work really hard, just be well-spoken and... You know, it's like, and like, not like, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna conform to any of this cheesiness because all you're doing is making yourself look like an asshole. Yeah, I mean, you know, people love to, uh, to latch on to a, a style or a thing. And I don't, it's funny because nobody saw hip hop coming. I mean, that's really a silly thing to say because nobody, no one ever sees anything coming. But, if you love this thing, and it's sort of, I don't want to say it hangs on, but it leans on a racial thing. Yeah. I'm being super articulate right now. But, you know, it, it has a, uh, a, a specific ethnic history. It has, a, you know, but you love it. How do you, how do you emulate it? But but by wearing the clothes and doing the thing and sort of you know it's it's so it's really it's really hard because back in the day you know I mean like this isn't the first time this has happened you know all these bands I was just watching an old uh, like a DVD of Motown 25 <laughs> and so you know they show all these clips and you're watching people like the Four Tops and the Spinners and the Temptations and stuff like that and all of these uh, all these white kids dancing to their music and kind of, and being really yeah. into it, being obsessed with that. And uh, sort of part of what the James Brown movie, the Get On Up movie was, was about, too. Yeah. But they were, with with few exceptions, you know, like a Zoot Tooted Little Richard or some, yeah. or, you know, in the 50s and 60s, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers <laughs> or Little Anthony and, and, you know, and the Imperials were wearing the same thing as these white kids were. They had on sweaters, too, and they had on slacks, and they had on button-down shirts, you know. It wasn't like when, uh, you know, as an example, Run DMC, again, yeah. showed up, and everyone was like, well, I'm, I have to wear Adidas with no <laughs> shoelaces in them, and I, I got to get that bomber jacket or that starter jacket. I got to, well, you know. With that stuff, though, like, <clears throat> with, like, when they were, like, in the 60s, when they were, like, wearing, like, you know, the sweaters and that, was that them as much as it was somebody telling them how to dress when they're on camera and stuff, or...? I think people just dressed a certain way. Like, I don't think there was a, a black way to dress and a white way to dress. There still really isn't, but, you know, hip-hop definitely said, took on its own, became its own culture. And, and uh, I mean, sure, you know, you, the, the Jacksons said, well, when we go out on stage, we're all going to be in sequins, and I'm gonna, this guy's going to wear a band leader outfit, and this person's going to wear, a, you know, I don't know, a spangly... Shirt or something, you know, but oh, I think the, the, the outfits should have been like a warning about the Jackson family, like early on. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> Did anyone dress anyone else dress like that? I think they were kind of well, that's not true. I mean, a lot of those groups had that 
the one that leather and the and the. Yeah, but they didn't have a child with them. That was the. <laughs> I feel like that's where the line is. Is no. like the Partridge family dressed kind of ridiculous, but they didn't like. They were all just the same. Yeah. And they weren't dressed that ridiculous for what they, for the era, for the era yeah, they were. Yeah. I, I don't know, maybe they did, but I just remember a lot of like those those velvet sort of jumpsuits and then the big fluffy collars coming out of them. And then you think about Danny Bonaducci now and you're like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so, all right, so, and, so how did the idea of co- turning this into a documentary about a musical, like how did that, like, oh, how, how did it go from like, yeah... From the frustration into this, like, <clears throat> short film. Well, I mean, it was... Thug's Musical was a stand-up bit that I put together. And I was just thinking about it. I was thinking about the frustration. Because in the bit, <clears throat> and, it, and this ends up as a scene in the movie, uh, I talk about going to this audition. And this actually happened here. This happened here in San Francisco on North Beach. I went into an audition, and the call was for a... I think it really was... I think... I say gangster rapper, but I think they were really asking for a P. Diddy type. I think that's okay. actually what the call was. A P. Diddy type. And I thought, look, I used to rap. I could do this. I could... And, you know, in the bit, I say I could sag my jeans and try to... You know... And I genuinely... That's what I, you know, thought. And then I showed up there. And at the time... <clears throat> in the Bay Area, I know... Probably elsewhere, but... There was this real push by all these agencies for... Uh, quote unquote real looking actors real people regular faces whatever and so that's never been fat in the history of the entire entertainment history yeah. that's never been fat yeah they say, <laughs> when they say real they just mean just a little south of Brad Pitt yeah. I always joke about how they can only be one successful big dude in Hollywood at any given time <laughs> so until Kevin James dies like my career yeah. is going nowhere you're right just, then I'll just fill in that you gotta spot. wait Yeah, you just gotta wait but so I showed up and yeah, it was like I realized these these thugs, these dudes are this is for real. Like yeah. these dudes look like there might have been a few actors peppered in there, but okay. they it was as, as if they found some real G's. Okay. And and I showed up and just like hello, <laughs> and so I just knew that I was gonna get that. And I you know I was very frustrated with it, and so I was. In the I was, I was I thought of this this idea that yeah I could do that I could play a thug it would just sort of have to be in like a Broadwayish type of a very <laughs> West Side Story Sharks vs Jets kind of thing and and uh, and I sort of was like oh yeah like you know a song like this and a, cu- a couple of ideas for a song you know and I remember thinking about this I was in the shower and I was thinking about this and then I thought that is dumb. You're going to look like an idiot if you do that. Knock it off. And I never did it. And then one day I was like, you know, you should try that one thing you thought of a long time ago. And as I was walking to the club, I sort of put the songs together. Just the very short versions of songs. Yeah. And I went to the club and tried it uh, here <laughs> at the punchline. And it worked. I was like, holy shit. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard you do that bit. Like, I think I've You've only, never heard I've, the I've, bit? I've only, I've only seen the musical. Well, let me do it for you right now. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I mean... It's a fun bit to do because it's sort of, I, it's you know, it's just me being goofy and doing this over the top kind of Broadway, you know, hands going and all this stuff. And like, do you come from that world? Like, do you have a theater background or anything at all? A little bit. I mean, in college I did theater, and um, I have no real. It's it sucks because I, well, it's a, you know whatever. But I have no like I never did any formal theater or acting okay. training which was really frustrating we didn't have a theater educational theater program at my school okay. and but we had a theater pro, we had like we put on plays and do shit like that and so but I you know I don't I, my family loved you know my mom and her sisters and her their family they loved musicals and all that shit my, yeah. my aunt was just yelling at me the other day I don't even know if this is a musical but it was some Oh, the movie Holiday Inn. Have you heard, have you heard of the movie Holiday Inn? It's an old movie from the 50s or maybe even 40s. I don't know. But she was like, you know what I'm talking about. Holiday Inn. I was like, look, I've never really seen that. I know you guys love it. And I know you've talked about it. But I have never okay. seen it. So they they sort of I, maybe informed a little bit of that. But I hated musicals growing up. 
so, so you know. See, I'm the opposite. I had the full, like, I had the, I've been doing theater since I was, like, 12. Oh, really? Yeah, like, I, like that's why it's, like, I, he talked about how you were a performer, but you weren't a comedian yet. I was the same Yeah. Thing. Like, my stage presence was, like, maybe, like, a six or a seven. Mm-hmm. But my material was, like, a three. Like, it took a yeah. while for those to, like, even out. Like, I yeah. knew how to be in front of a crowd, but I had no idea how to be a comedian. Exactly. I mean, you just, like, yeah, I, I, I had been performing since I was very little. I was a big ham. I just loved yeah. being on stage. But in one capacity or another. So I wasn't afraid of being in front of an audience. I was just like, oh, well, what's going to happen when I say these words that I thought of and you know yeah no I have a, I have a degree in performance theater as worthless as that oh, is look at you. <laughs> yeah no, I know I had n- I was not really that big I didn't do any musicals certainly when I yeah. was doing theater but I, there's something funny and absurd about just the over the top nature of uh, of just you know singing these songs and going big and the whole thing like I just it seems it's so ridiculous and that just was funny to me and so um, I, that's you know I, I like doing that bit but I was performing I was uh, I was middling for David Allen Greer and, uh, and we worked together a lot and he saw me do that bit and he was like hey uh, at the time he was Preparing to, he was uh, working on Chocolate News. Okay. And the show hadn't come out yet, but he was like, "Hey man, you want to you want to write for the show? You got to write that bit. You got to do something with that." I was like, "What the hell?" And so, <clears throat> when I moved to LA, I I wrote a piece for the show. And Chocolate okay. News was like a fake news magazine yeah, show. Yeah, I remember it. And so I wrote this. It's funny. I remember. It, yeah, it was I love funny. David Greer. I've, I've loved him my whole life. I think he's hilarious. He's one of the funniest people I know. Yeah. Like off stage as well, and and naturally not like overdoing it, or but he's just a funny, funny dude. I think I fell in love with David Al Greer during uh, Blank Band, like when I was a kid. I watched oh, really? movie, and I just was just a huge fan of his ever since. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's hilarious. Um, so I yeah I wrote that thing for the show and then he told me oh it's not gonna work for the show so don't worry that was the piece I was like this would have gotten me the job <laughs> like I wrote some other pieces but I felt like that would have that was you know and so I didn't get the job and I couldn't use the piece anyway and so uh, I was like well why don't you just try to make it like a write a short you know and so I just kind of took it and tweaked it and did some other things with it and I had this film and um, I so it became the documentary thing because of David's show the structure okay. of David's show was sort of like a woman like a 2020 type of thing okay. and I just kind of took that and, ran. and it just felt funnier to the jokes if, if the, it just felt like the, those jokes lent themselves to that type of format was the idea always for you to star in it or well I mean yeah, not you know when I was writing it for Chocolate News, no, I just was like, oh, I hope this, I hope this gets me a job, and I yeah. hope they use it or whatever. But once I started working on it for myself, yeah, because you know, I all these little shorts that I was doing and stuff, they were just a means to sort of showcase myself and yeah. and and my writing or whatever I was doing, but like. There came a point where I had been in San Francisco so long, and by the time I wrote Thugs and was doing all that, I, I had moved and I was in L.A., but I was in San Francisco so long that uh, I was kind of just, what are you, what are you doing? And I, I was kind of just doing stand-up and going through the motions, and, and there was a whole, remember that whole, like, crackle thing, and people, everyone was doing web series, yeah. and they were paying for all this stuff, and, and all these people who had started after me they were writing and producing these little shorts and these web series and they were getting paid for it and they were kind of where I'm at now it's like I'm seeing all these people that like started after me like like getting these like writing jobs and things like that well I mean it's you that always happens it'll never stop happening and it doesn't mean anything it just means well look what they did and but it also like it lit a fire under my ass I mean I it took for another comedian, a younger comedian, to, like, he asked me to be in his short. Yeah, someone had fallen out, and he asked me to do it at the last minute. And it was so fun, and I was like, oh, yeah, I love this. I love acting, and I love kind of writing and producing these things. I got to do this shit, you know? This is what I haven't been 
this is what I've been missing is, is this kind of stuff. And it's just a way to sort of go to put yourself out there and let people see what you, you know, yeah. you do. What's funny is, like, before I had ever actually met you, I'm pretty sure, I was like... I was a big fan of the Siskel and Negro stuff, like when you guys were five and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no idea it was you and Kamel. Oh, no, really? At first, like I didn't realize that. Like I knew you guys, That's and really that funny. was you two on there because it's everything so played up, like <laughs> yeah, it's so yeah. turned up the dead. But like it was just I, I loved all that stuff, like the podcast. Thanks, I loved man. it and stuff like that. Yeah, like when did you and Kamel hook up? Well, we. Um, I mean, we always tell people that we didn't like each other <laughs> when we first started, and I don't know that that's entirely true, but. We were, we definitely were like, oh, who's this other black guy? <laughs> and so we were probably a little wary of each other. But then, you know, we as we, people, you just sort of get to know your your community. Uh, we did, and we became friends. And um, but we just started writing together, and I, you know, I think we were. I like I took him with me on the road, with, you know, to one of these one nighter runs, and we kind of had fun doing that. We. I'm using the term fun loosely uh, but you know we we decided to try to write a stand up together and then at some point we were, we started trying to write like feature scripts and stuff like that and we decided to write those and we did and um, you know we wrote several of them actually and uh, and other things sketches and we so we started trying to kind of we just sort of huddled up and we're like, well, we can let's try to get some TV writing jobs. And there were other people that were like, you guys are two black writers. You're kind of a... People are looking for you, yeah. you know, so you might as well, you know. And I think the thing that, would, that really cemented it for us is we were... Oh, he was a nanny. <laughs> he, Kamal was a nanny for a while. <laughs> um, okay, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was sort of this ridiculous thing, like, well, all right, whatever. And um, and so one night, I was like, I asked him, hey, man, um, we're going to go out to some bar or club. I don't know what the hell we were going to do. But I was like, you want to you try to roll? And he's like, no, nah, man, I got to watch the baby. I got to do the da <laughs> And I was like, okay. <laughs> and uh, and then we were just joking around about, you know, the idea of, like, cut to him out at the club with the baby strapped to him. <laughs> and we sort of just started riffing on that idea. Just dumb shit, like, yeah, we're at the basketball court, we're playing. <laughs> when I was got the baby, just boom, you know, like... And just trying to defend with the yeah, baby Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. You can't get past this. And so, um... So he came up to me uh, a day or two later, and he's like, "Man, I think we should really, we should really write, like, try to write some of these scripts. We, you know, put something together like this." And I was like, "Yeah, dude, you're right. Yeah, we really, we should do that." And he goes, "But you know, it's it's got to be that baby thing." And I was like, "Well, no, not we don't not that. That's dumb. But we should really do." He's like, "No." Just write the baby. And he's like, I know it sounds crazy, but we can really write something like this and sell it. And pe- you know, which is every screenwriter will tell you, don't write something because you think it will sell. Write what you love or know or whatever. But it was something so ridiculous and goofy, and we had so much fun writing it that it was sort of like, all right, what the, you know, why the fuck not? And we just started working on ideas like that and became writing partners. And and so, yeah, that's kind of we weirdly had this almost this reputation of being a couple in San Francisco after a while like not really but people I, I remember going to a, a baby shower the Siroff's baby shower <laughs> and Kamal couldn't make it but I did and I went and bought a bunch of baby stuff I bought a bunch of toys. I, you know, I like it. I go to the toy store and I like, I go, I go, oh, that would be cool. This would be fun for a kid. And that, you know, and so I, I bought several things. I'm buying like a, sh- I'm not fucking Santa, but uh, I gave them these gifts and, and, sh- and Sherry Syrup, <laughs> uh, she says to me, Oh, is this from you and Kamau? <laughs> like, he's not even here. Do you see him? It's just me. Can I just give you some presents? And it wasn't a whole lot. I could see if I had like ten gifts. It was like, yeah, I come out. But I had a few things, maybe three, 
And it was, it was just the weirdest thing. I was like, no, just started by some things for the kid. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but, you know, we, we've... Uh, He's been good to work with, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, like, were you involved in like the one man show he did? No, no not at all. I yeah. that was it's funny that sort of when we kind of started to busy ourselves with our own things. I mean, really, him. He well, because what happened with I mean, you know, this is his story, but uh, we did a we did a run in. Um, we did, <laughs> did some shows in Okinawa, mm-hmm. Japan, for the troops. And that was a difficult week. Um, <clears throat> you know, it was an adventure. It, it was, it, yeah, it was, it was a, that was a tough week. And so it was tough enough so that he was like, fuck this. And he just kind of stopped doing stand-up for a little while. And I think he was you know, kind of asking himself, well, what, what am I doing? And, and then he slowly started to look at what he liked and what he really wanted to talk about. And that's when this, the, the bell curve came about. He slowly okay. started putting that together. And, you know, he, he's a great solo show performer and director. And so mm-hmm. that's, that whole thing. Came. So I didn't have anything to do with that, but it was sort of the inception of totally biased yeah, which is what I ended up working on with him. You were on, you work on both seasons of that, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, yeah, I was there at the beginning when he was working on the. We did two pilots for the show. There was one that we did <clears throat> to show Chris Rock, okay, who had already met, come out and seen the show, and was interested in doing a show with him, and so we did that one, and that <laughs> that was just weird because he taped it here. Okay. In San Francisco. I was in L.A. And so I was in the pilot, though. Yeah. And I was playing... I So he, had, he did this thing where I was playing Obama. But Obama, he had... The bit was someone was, someone was on stage talking about something and, and saying something about Obama. And then Obama pops up on the screen. And so it was just me Skyping from my bedroom. It was the weirdest <laughs> thing ever. Like, it says, we rehearsed this, we went over this, and then it all boiled down to, when they shot it, me Skyping for about three or four minutes, doing a bit, and then goodbye, and that was it. The, all of this... We didn't record it, just, <laughs> just live music. I mean, yeah, it was, it was taped somewhere, but, okay. like, it, it's still... Yeah, I haven't seen it to this day, I don't know what it looks like, but... Uh, it was just a weird moment to be like, okay, the thing is happening. They're doing the thing. And I go on and do my thing. And then, boop, and we're done. And I, no, no one no one to talk to or call me. How'd that go? How'd they, they're still doing the show. So I just sort of, okay, well, I took my tie off and went and watched TV in the next room. <laughs> like, nothing was happening. So, yeah, I worked on that. And we had to, we had to shoot another pilot that Chris sort of funded. Four FX, and then they bought the show, and and I started working with them right away. A lot of SF cats were on that show, or were working on that show. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like Nato and Janine Brito. Nato, Janine Brito, Kevin Kataoka. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, that might have been. I feel like I'm forgetting somebody now, but I mean, even if most of the writers knew each other, mm-hmm. regardless, and then other SF people later joined. Guy Branham. Um, uh, Emily Heller did warm up for us. Oh, nice, oh, Emily's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's great. What? Um, wait. So it wasn't. It wasn't like a daily show the first season, right? It was just no. once a week. No, it was once a week. It was okay. that was nice. <laughs> that was nice. It was. I mean, you know, it started out weekly, and we were still figuring out how to make it, and we kind of figured out how to make it, and then FX season two was like, all right, we're gonna go daily. And we were kind of like, okay, <laughs> and you know, that's a that's a tall. Or- we were not the oiled machine, the well oiled, well oiled machine that, you know, Daily Show or Colbert was at that point. Yeah. And so, and also still, you guys, even though you guys were a daily topical thing, mm-hmm. you still your show didn't quite fit in that mold that they kind of had created with those kind of shows. Well, no, I mean. Their shows are considered fake news shows, mm. and none of those shows are. 
I mean, last week tonight isn't a fake news show. I never, I never liked that because it's not. It's the news. We're just commenting yeah. it. We're just, you know, you don't yeah. do a, you know, you're. There's nothing fake about your performance. Yeah. If you're talking about something that happened, it happened. You're just talking about it through your perspective, yeah. and so. Yes, they're fake and that they look like news shows and they're not real news shows, but they're talking about the news. So, but we, you know, I we became more of a let's talk about the cultural goings on and issues and, and whatever the topic of the topic of the day that interested him and well, you know. Yeah. So, what's it like over there for the like? What's the writing? What's kind of the process for like in the room for uh, uh, for John Olerson for uh, oh. Well, I mean, it's that is a whole different beast because um, we'll, we're back to being weekly, okay. which is nice. Um, <laughs> but there, you know, I mean, we work from like Tuesday through Sunday. We're on the air Sunday. We tape Sundays, and so we um, we spend like the first part of the day, the first hour and a half, pitching via email. Mm-hmm. And so John and uh, the showrunner, um, Tim Carvel, will go through all the... They're looking at those and, you know, something might jump out at John and, or, you know, he might be interested in this or that or whatever. And then we all sit down and we meet and he sort of talks about, oh, I like this. Uh, oh, I want to talk about this thing. Let's look for more stuff about that. Let's, you know, mm-hmm. and then we'll go off and sometimes I'll assign people something. Okay, so like some, sometimes you'll get like homework or something like that that you need to do or... Yeah, but that, uh, I mean, it's a slow progression throughout the week. So like on a, on a, our, when we start on a Wednesday, uh, we might not get any assignments. Mm-hmm. And then on a Thursday, okay. I'm going to give it, you know, or maybe later in the day, Wednesday, they'll dish out a sign. Like something happened that needs to be addressed. Or something, or they go, okay, we know we want to do this. Let's just okay. get something working on it. And, you know, they'll, they'll assign it, and, you know. And then maybe, maybe the rest of us will just spend the next 24 hours pitching stuff. It just, okay. it sort of depends, but it's a pretty, I like the process a lot. It feels... I don't know if easygoing is the right word, but it's it's definitely it just feels uh, a lot simpler. It's just different. I know a lot of shows you're sitting in a room pitching. Yeah. In Totally Vice, we were in the room pitching ideas, and that was fun too because you're riffing off things and you're, you know, I mean, we got really good at Totally Vice at taking a thing and shaping it shaping it in the room and going this is a great way to go with this or this is the thing and you know piling on how collaborative is it oh it's very collaborative I mean you know you'll get assigned something and then so essentially what happens is uh, two writers will get the same assignment Mm -hmm. and they say go off and write this thing and we are both writing on the same topic and then they'll take both of those drafts and they'll look at it and then oh and then they'll meet with us both of us at the same time. Oh, I like this from your draft. I like this from your draft. I like this. Uh, so, and they'll tell you what they want. Oh, we also want to talk about this other thing. Cause, so could you throw that in there? And then those two writers will go and they'll work on it together. Okay. And then they get it back, give it back to John and Tim, and and they'll look at it and they'll start to shape it and sort of put it, you know, more into John's voice. Mm-hmm. And and then they might say, oh, we need a joke for this thing, or we're looking for a punchline for this thing, and this joke didn't work, so let's fill it in. And mm-hmm. and the writers will pitch on that. So it's super, you know, a lot of people have their hands on it. And um, sometimes you look up and your piece is very different than what you started with. And then sometimes it's like, oh, look at all this shit of mine that made it into the thing. It's it's still there. The structure is still there. The nice. jokes are still there. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. But you've... I have to admit, like, without hesitation, I can say your career is something to be respected. Like, oh, I think <laughs> well, thank you. I think everything I've seen you do and seen you be a part of, I've always enjoyed and I've always thought was really funny. Thanks, man. Oh, that's um, very nice. Yeah, thanks for sitting down, man. This was a lot sure. Of fun. No, this was uh, it was very comfortable. I just <laughs> had to sit on this bed and talk after eating a Caesar salad. And uh, yeah, thanks for doing this. This was fun. So that was Kevin Avery, guys. Huh? Great interview, right? I had a lot of fun. Um, I enjoyed talking to Kevin so much I could have talked to him for three hours. Um, make sure you check him out, all his stuff, all the web series stuff he's done, 
uh, last week tonight with John Oliver. Uh, if you catch reruns of um, Totally Biased with Kamal Bell, please watch it. It's so goddamn funny. Uh, and catch him on stage. KevinAveryComedy.com. Find him out there. Find where he's performing. Go see him live because it is amazing. It is a good show. You will be thoroughly entertained by watching Kevin Avery live. Um, please, please, please uh, remember what I mentioned about uh, relief groups for LGBT community in Orlando. Uh, don't worry about buying my albums. Don't worry about any of that. Just send them some help. You know, send them ten bucks that you would have spent on my comedy album or something stupid and frivolous and uh, send it their way. Uh, I think it's important to remind Orlando that humanity isn't ugly. I think that's important. Because I've been trying to remind myself that humanity isn't always ugly. And if I find out that a bunch of my listeners donated to the cause over there in Orlando, it'll remind me of that too. Uh, Like I said... Please check out my website for all the upcoming shows. July 8th, Fresno. July 16th, Napa. Uh, July 21st, Modesto. And then two more nights in Napa, August 26th and 27th. Uh, And every Wednesday, Walnut Creek, Massey's. You know the drill there. Every Wednesday, I will be there with a different lineup of funny every week. The music for the podcast, once again, as always, done by the amazingly talented Rob Dillinger. You can find him at Rob Dillinger on Twitter or at www.robdillinger.com. You can follow us, the show, the NQF Pod, on Facebook, facebook.com slash NQF Pod, or at NQF Pod on the Twitter. Please tweet at us. I dare you. Or you can tweet at me directly, at Greg Esdorian on the Twitter. Or you can find all of those links to all this stuff at www.gregasdorian.com everything's there the blog past episodes of the show the twitter links all the social media stuff there if you go to gregasdorian.com you are going to find everything you need to get around the world that is my comedy thank you guys for tuning in see you guys next week have a good one and enjoy life. Hug someone you love. <laughs>